Good afternoon. Welcome to our live question and answer with Bill Barker as Thomas Jefferson. I'm Melissa Chelly Thaxton, and today's discussion is about Jefferson's travels, where he went and why, as well as where he didn't go, and what he gleaned from his journeys. Please be sure to add your questions in the comments and let us know where on the internet you are traveling from. Oh, citizens, my pleasure. Happy to greet you here once again at our Monticello. You, you found me there gazing out the window here in our North Pavilion at Mount Alto, uh, the tall mountain. Uh, I acquired it, if you will, in 1777, uh, after returning from Philadelphia and the birth of our new nation. I've often had aspirations as to what might be built thereupon, and I could not help but reflect as I was gazing out the window, a design for an observation tower. That's right, something that uh, would be able to <laughs> send uh, to the top uh, and observe the motions, if you will, of the sky at night with the telescope. But the point I'm driving at is I, I thought the design for the observation tower would be likened unto a pagoda a pagoda observation tower, which I was able to visit and venture into at Chanteloup, uh, a chateau that I, I was welcome to visit during my five years in France. Um, that is one of the many, many places that I will never forget in, in my travels. And I'm happy to say, yes, I have traveled extensively, uh, but more so throughout the kingdoms of Europe than my own native land. I've been asked many times about my travels and uh, enjoyed to discuss upon those areas which I have visited, the memories that I still have, and my desire to continue traveling if allowed enough time. So I would certainly enjoy hearing your questions and curiosities for this time we have together today. Uh, will you allow me to be seated? Well, thank you. And uh, we have with us uh, Mrs. Melissa uh, Telly Thaxton. Uh, I'm delighted that she's with us again to engage your questions and commentaries for us. So if you will, Melissa, what is our first question today? Of course. So Mr. Jefferson, before you moved to Monticello in February of 1770, had you traveled much away from Shadwell Farm where you were born? Yes, I certainly did when I was a boy. Uh, of course, Shadwell Farm was along the Three Chop Road. Uh, it was named um, Three Chop because George III, when he ascended to the throne, ordered the trees chopped three times every several miles to remind people they were on that main artery of commerce and migration east-west through our former colony of Virginia. So you had the opportunity to meet many who were on their travels uh, and as well to engage travels with our family. So I would say while still a young boy at Shadwell, my first travel, <laughs> extensively so, was little more than two days uh, in the saddle when I was two years old. That was 17 and 45. My father was removing our family from Shadwell to Tuckahoe Plantation, where we would live for several years. This was because father was the executor to the estate of William Randolph, my mother's first cousin. Mr. Randolph passed away when he was a young man. And so father as executor was overseeing the education and the rearing of the Randolph people. Uh, that was my earliest cognizance. At two years of age, I was lifted up to a, an individual on horseback. Uh, I remember it being a very soft pillow uh, and there, uh, in the lap of this individual, we made that journey <laughs> two days eastwards to Tuckahoe Plantation. Now then, of course, before I moved to the mountain that, that February of 1770, I had traveled up to, uh, to Philadelphia, uh, my first trip to Philadelphia. Many <laughs> do not know this. I was only 23 years of age. It was 1766, and the purpose of that travel was to maintain good health. That is correct. I went up to Philadelphia in order to be inoculated against the smallpox. 
it was Dr. Shippen, William Shippen, who performed the inoculation upon me. So, Melissa, you raise a, a good point here with respect to travel. We should be cautious in our travels, no matter where we go, to maintain good health. To think that I would make it the object of traveling seven to nine days from Shadwell Farm up to Philadelphia to be inoculated against the smallpox. It what put me in mind of the necessity of an inoculation. I endeavored to perform inoculation on many of our families here at Monticello and to provide in kind for the British prisoners of war, the Hessians in particular, Barrack along what is still referred to as Barracks Road. And I hope we do not forget that when Edward Jenner, the Englishman, came about with a vaccination for smallpox, I was one of the first to promote it throughout our new nation when I was elected president in 1800. And I vaccinated 70 to 80 of my family here at Monticello. What an important reason to travel. In addition to Philadelphia, how far in North America um, were you traveling? How far in North America? <laughs> Not far enough. Truly, I wish I had traveled more throughout my own nation uh, than I did accomplish when I was our nation's minister plenipotentiary uh, there in France. Well, lamentably, I have never been west of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Now, I've gone far into Bath County, yes, Rock Ridge uh, Gap, uh, Rockfish Gap, uh, but I have never been south of the Virginia Carolina line. Now, however, to the east, I've traveled far to, well, the eastern shore of Virginia, uh, into Maryland, of course, uh, up through the original three counties that now make uh, Delaware, uh, and then up to Philadelphia. I've been through Jersey to Princetown, uh, up to uh, New York City, and farther north from New York City out along the North uh, the Long Island Sound through Connecticut, uh, up into Rhode Island to Providence, and as well to Newport, Rhode Island, and then up farther to Boston. Now then, when I think of going farther north than Boston, I went to Salem along the coast there in Massachusetts, and eventually up to Portsmouth in New Hampshire. Now, I would venture that's about as far north as I ever traveled in my own country. I, I never crossed the York River to go into uh, our new state of Maine. However, I wonder as I traveled with Mr. Madison, that was in the spring of 1791, the two of us are venturing up to New York City, up the Hudson River, a father, if you will, to Lake George. Oh, that was one of the finest bodies of water I have ever seen, next to perhaps Lake Como. Uh, then up to Lake Champlain, uh, Mr. Madison and I ventured uh, through the Bennington Battleground and spent a delightful time in Bennington, Vermont. We were studying, of course, the destruction of the Hessian fly, so named because the Hessians had brought it over uh, during the Revolutionary War. But then we were also interested to ascertain the political sentiments of Vermonters, a very hearty breed and devoutly American. Remember, they had been in the midst of the contest between New Hampshire and New York. So I would venture to say then that considering whether Bennington, Vermont or Portsmouth, New Hampshire, one the more north than the other, those were the extents of my travels in our nation to the north, more so uh, than any other uh, distance in our country. So it sounds like from the time you were a young boy, well, through your entire life, you're doing a lot of traveling. Can you tell us something about what travel was like in America in your youth and maybe perhaps some of the changes you observed uh, with technologies and speeds um, as you aged? That is a very good question, because if I were to apply any one word to <laughs> the elements of traveling as I have known it, it would be cumbersome, extremely cumbersome. Uh, I say that only because, well, I live even now in a four mile an hour world. I know of no place upon the globe where you can travel any faster than a ship at sea 
or a horse on land. Now, when you figure that you can walk comfortably uh, three miles an hour and ride comfortably at a consistent pace, uh, say five miles an hour, well, you take the average of that and there you are. I live in a four mile an hour world. Uh, a young boy the other day said, Mr. Jefferson, I have a speed limit sign in my neighborhood that limits the speed to 15 miles an hour. Mercy. I said, lad, I cannot imagine traveling so quickly, so swiftly. How can you possibly think? So there you are to recognize that the pace of travel is often uh, slow in its consistency. Uh, and then when you figure the roads are but mere, for the most part, mere native pathways, those pathways established by the natives long before any European ever came here, they were no less uh, engaged in commerce and visiting and traveling for themselves, but good mercy pursuing the hunt as they so often did across this entire continent for centuries, if not millennia. Well, when the European arrived, particularly the British, they would want to straighten out those native pathways, uh, make for roads, but they were not properly, uh, what you may say, maintained. Uh, someone mentioned uh, macadam, I'd never heard of it, but no. Uh, and in the cities, there were certain cobblestoned alleys, but the main roads were dirt roads. They would suffer during extreme inclemency, be so muddy, or as I have written many times, deep, deep. Your horse would get stuck, your, your phaeton, your carriages, your stagecoaches would too often get stuck. And there uh, you would have to spend so much time uh, to try and pull that stagecoach out of the ruts or your own horse. Do you know, I remember months, I cannot remember, who was I riding at the time? Um, my horse and I were we're making our way through Virginia. I cannot recall where, it might have been to Williamsburg. And the, the rains were consistent quite heavily for many, many hours. And the roads became nearly untravelable. This particular horse had it. He simply stopped. He <laughs> went down into the mud and just sat there. There was nothing I could possibly do to invigorate him, to get him to continue forward. And so I sat in the saddle upon him as long as he chose to be there. And then finally, finally, yes, he helped himself up, although the, the noise of the suction you could have heard for a mile beyond. <laughs> so it sounds like in some of your travels, sometimes you're traveling alone, other times you uh, alluded to traveling, uh, for example, with Mr. Madison. Um, can you tell us who's typically traveling with you? Are you normally bringing some of your enslaved people along with you? And some of our citizen listeners also added on, who would you love to travel with? I loved from the time I was a young boy to, to travel with Jupiter, uh, Jupiter Evans. Uh, he was the son, if you will, of, of great George. And uh, well, I'll never forget as was customary, uh, the eldest son of an enslaved family was more or less gifted to the eldest son of a freeholder's family. So Jupiter and I grew up together. And he accompanied me on my early days, 120 miles in the saddle eastward, as I attended the old Royal College of William and Mary in Williamsburg. Uh, we roamed together there in the garret of the old Royal College. It was as if we were brothers. We knew one and the other so very, very well. And then later when I went up to Philadelphia, it was Robert Hemmings who accompanied me there. Uh, Robert and I traveled between Monticello, as I was living here at that time, up to Philadelphia and several times, 75 and 76. And uh, then later, yes, of course, uh, there were others of the enslaved families here who were coaching and, uh, and whom I enjoyed to travel with, uh, truly, uh, to be able to talk upon various subjects and to understand one and the other, and particularly to understand the neglects, if you will, uh, the partiality of the laws under which we were born. Uh, the most prominent, of course, our own Declaration of American Independence, which though it promotes boldly that all are created equal, all are born free, you know, our Declaration does not, does not grant 
freedom uh, to the enslaved. So these were conversations we would have like one with the other would normally. And I appreciated those uh, instances to help me better understand these great contradictions. I cannot deny, and this is no excuse, but I, I enjoyed making my, my way in such travels. Well, without a question, I certainly enjoyed uh, traveling with my father while he was alive, but that was denied me when he passed away at only 49 years of age. In 1757, I was only 14. I enjoyed traveling with mother. Mother and I would travel to visit her, her parents who were still living at Dungeness. Uh, they are a great distance from Monticello along the north bank of the James River. And of course, Mrs. Jefferson and I traveled extensively. I will never forget uh, our honeymoon. We were married back east, married at her father's farm, the forest in Charles City County, first of the year, 17 and 72. And then we embarked at the, towards the end of January, the 120 miles westward that I might introduce her to our mountain area. It was during a snowstorm. I will never forget it. Uh, within the two days, the snows were four feet deep. We had to abandon the feet and make the rest of our way on horseback. And I'll never forget, of course, bringing her over the threshold of what I had called my hermitage. That was the small little brick cottage, the first building on top of Monticello. And that evening, of course, um, well, it became our honeymoon cottage. So when you ask of the many that I have enjoyed to pursue my travels, it is so extensive that as I think back, those were my earliest, earliest pleasures uh, with those whom I was blessed to, to travel. Thank you. We've been talking a bit about all of your travels throughout um, this great country of ours, but you also had the opportunity when you were commissioned as our nation's second minister plenipotentiary to France, succeeding Dr. Benjamin Franklin in 1784. Was your trip to France the first time you had been at sea? And what did you learn from your experiences in that ocean voyage? Thank you, Melissa. That's a very good question. Um, I only made one uh, transatlantic, well, two transatlantic uh, voyages, uh, that is over to the kingdoms of Europe from our nation and then back again. But as far as being at sea, no, I had already experienced that when I was a young boy. In fact, one of the ways by which you would travel up to Philadelphia uh, was simply to uh, venture out to a boat docked in either the York or the James River at Williamsburg. Uh, the tender would take you out there to the boat uh, that was anchored in the rivers. And so then you would voyage and down either of those rivers into the Chesapeake Bay and then go northwards, uh, usually up to the Chester River, and you would disembark at Chester uh, and then make your way from Chester on the roadways up to Philadelphia. Uh, another method, of course, was to sail out of the Chesapeake Bay into the Atlantic Ocean and then sail up the coast. In that effort, yes, I was well acquainted with, uh, with ocean travel. And uh, after uh, returning, if you will, from the uh, those five delightful years in La Belle France, I will never forget an occasion when President Washington, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, General Alexander Hamilton, myself, and I believe that Mr. Adams was on the voyage, uh, if the four of us venturing on a fishing trip <laughs> out Long Island Sound uh, or by way of boat up along the coast of Connecticut and then uh, ultimately to um, Providence in Rhode Island. We had a most marvelous stay in Providence City. And then from Providence, we ventured over to Newport uh, in Rhode Island. So that was for the most part uh, on water. And then otherwise, of course, uh, in, uh, in phaetons, in a carriage. Now, when Mr. Madison and I uh, came back from our trip up to the uh, Northern Lakes into Vermont, uh, we came back by way of the Connecticut River. So we came down uh, through the western part of Massachusetts and Connecticut to the Long Island Sound. And then at the Long Island Sound by boat, we continued to uh, New York City. And then from New York by boat, uh, we went down to the coast to the Delaware Bay and then uh, northwards up uh, the Delaware River to Philadelphia. That's where our government was at that time. It had just recently moved there from New York City uh, to the city of Philadelphia, uh, 1791. 
While you were living in Paris for five years, I believe you had the opportunity to travel to some other countries throughout Europe. Um, I'm curious, what did you learn from those experiences? And one of our citizen listeners, uh, Brendan, is curious about some of the things you saw, particularly, uh, I believe you got to see Shakespeare's chair. Oh my, yes. We, we not only were able to see Shakespeare's chair, but we were also able to um, take a piece of it. Now, when I say we, that I might not be looked upon entirely guilty myself, uh, Mr. Adams did as well. And Mrs. Adams was there to watch the entire uh, burglary, if you may refer to it as that. Uh, I did have the pleasure, while I was our nation's uh, minister plenipotentiary, plenipotentiary meaning plenty, meaning all, potentiary meaning powers, in that capacity, I held all powers in representing our nation's government, executive, legislative, and judicial at foreign courts. Uh, we had five representing our nation at foreign courts at that time. Uh, this was between 1784 and 1789. And if you remember, having referred to Mr. Adams, he was our nation's minister plenipotentiary at the court of King George III. So I did have an opportunity to travel with Mr. and Mrs. Adams through the Midlands of England during that time. Uh, I had been invited by Mr. Adams to come over to London uh, for an occasion when the British court had invited many ambassadors of European kingdoms to come to London for signing negotiations and treaties uh, with the British monarchy. So Mr. Adams thought this would be a good time for the two of us representing our nation to get work completed with other nations and treaties to be signed. Well, the British uh, got wind of that and they did everything they could to prohibit Mr. Adams and I being together with these other ambassadors. So we simply decided to take a trip and visit many of the elegant gardens and the manor houses all throughout the Midlands of England. We visited Blenheim, we visited Stowe, we visited Chiswick, uh, Lisos, a Hagley House, uh, I carried with me my uh, volumes of Thomas Watley, Capability Brown, if you will. And uh, we studied these gardens, studied the, the follies that uh, were so profuse throughout many of these elegant gardens and manor lands. And uh, that was when we visited Stratford-upon-Avon, visited the house in which they said uh, the great bard passed away. Uh, no less we visited the house where they say he was born. And then we visited where it is said he was buried. I know Mr. Adams had well, somewhat of a curiosity as to whether he really was buried there, but that is his opinion and not mine. But it was quite impressive to see um, the, the tomb of William Shakespeare. Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be he which spares these bones and cursed be he that moves the more and such. That is what is inscribed upon the great bard's tomb. We, of course, did not touch uh, the tomb. <laughs> Sounds like you've had many wonderful travels and adventures. Don is curious to know, what's your favorite place you've been to? And Daniel's curious, which place you traveled or which trip you took that perhaps you regret? Daniel, I will tell you that uh, the greatest place that I could possibly visit is our own nation. And I mean that sincerely, truly so. Uh, I believe that the family of man has never been provided greater resources by our creator than here on the continent of North America. We truly are best blessed to be settled here. And I hope to the hundredth and thousandth generation uh, to the West, almost a manifest destiny. And I hope that this experience may be, be that of all Americans, and by that I mean all of us who have come here, all of us who have been here, those who have not the opportunity at present uh, because of the shackles, if you will, of enslavement, those who have not the opportunity because they labor so extensively a uh, day in, day out, and night times as well for their sustenance. But I think our nation provides remarkable examples of the wonders of nature, the works of the great architect of our universe. Now, if you were to say uh, over the seas, uh, those five years in France were just um, 
or just delightful experiences upon the vaunted scene of Europe. To be able to experience that city of light, and I mean that because old medieval Paris uh, was being um, dismantled and demolished with a new vibrant bright city being built from the, the limestone that was underneath uh, the, the confines of Paris. To see these magnificent modern buildings, and when I say modern, I mean constructed with the, the beautiful balance and symmetry of architecture, a, a rejuvenation of the splendor that was Rome, uh, lifting the spirit, if you will, is providing for greater happiness uh, with very large windows, of course, and very high ceilings, ennobling architecture, in my opinion. After five years in La Belle France, I came to love these people so very, very much. It became my second home. I hope I will have time uh, to revisit. And yet that's not to say that having had the opportunity to venture into the northern kingdoms of the Italys, oh, and the most extraordinary journey of uh, three days upon a burrow uh, crossing the Alps from Menton, there along the French Riviera, to come down on the opposite side in Inconi, uh, C-O-N-I, and having the experience at the height of the Alps, I believe three ranges uh, that I traveled, uh, the experience of passing through Col de Tende, C-O-L-D-E-T-E-N-D-E. -E -E. It was the pass, the pass at the height of the Alps. And I'll never forget seeing that magnificent town uh, built up on the heights of the Alps, I believe San Giorgio, I may be incorrect in my memory here, San Giorgio, uh, built on top of the Alps as I saw it with clouds having come down to that particular height. It was as if you were looking at a town suspended in a cloud from that height. It was phantasmagorical. I should never forget it. And then, of course, so traveling through the northern Italy's to Turin and then Milan, Milano, having the opportunity to, to see Leonardo's uh, most extraordinary Last Supper, to be able to visit Lake Como. I referred to that earlier. A fine body of water to visit with our Sal Alessandro Volta. I had that opportunity, though I kept it rather quiet. He was so interested to hear my reflections upon Dr. Franklin, the two of those gentlemen, the foremost electricians of our time. And then to be able to travel down to Genoa and to see some of the most magnificent palazzios and the, the great art that they had. And then from Genoa to sail uh, the Mediterranean to Albengo, that was a voyage I do not care to remember. Oh, it was so very, very rough. Again, I say again, I suffered seasickness. And that is what I suffered on my first transatlantic voyage, uh, sailing from Boston in the summer of 1784 uh, to uh, France. It took me one year uh, to get over that seasickness. So I would not say that, um, that ocean travel has um, been so agreeable to me as I find great comfort every day upon horseback. In traveling to all of these amazing places, Chester in particular is curious, how do you get there? What maps were readily available? How do you navigate that in your time? Chester, this is precisely the suggestion that I've made to so many who endeavor to travel extensively. Uh, be, uh, be cautious and assured beforehand to acquire as many maps, as many travel books as you possibly can to acquaint yourself with these travels, so that it will not be as if you're simply venturing into terra incognita, unknown land. Uh, you will afford yourself a great knowledge of where you want to go, and to realize that as you venture there, you may never come back to that place. So you want to experience as much of it as you possibly can. Uh, maps, if you will, and books are the greatest advantage for this, and I myself, uh, made effort to acquire them as I, I continued to travel throughout the kingdoms of Europe. Uh, this is advice that I actually gave to a, a young Virginia gentleman, John Bannister the Younger. I, I suggested to him that he acquire as many uh, maps and books that he possibly could. I also gave the advice uh, to the Shippen boys, Thomas Shippen of Philadelphia. They wrote me, asked me 
my opinion says they would be venturing over to the kingdoms of Europe. In fact, I, I delineated for them an entire itinerary of where they ought to travel and what they ought to see and assured them that when they venture into any city uh, where they've never been before, that they, they ascend to the highest point, be at the top of a cathedral spire or a, a hill in the vicinage and look out from that highest point in order that they may better understand that city, its situation, uh, let alone the livelihood of the residents uh, there. So yes, and here furthermore, I'll never forget when I, I ventured up with Mr. Adams to, to The Hague. Uh, we went up there to the Netherlands. It was the most enjoyable uh, travel. And Mr. Adams had to leave to return, if you will, to England. But I then decided to travel down the Rhine. What a magnificent experience. And yet I had certain maps and certain books that accompanied me. Uh, so that I knew uh, the, the beauty of the various towns even before the boat arrived to them. Uh, Frankfurt, of course, and Mannheim, and, and then finally disembarking in Strasbourg. What a magnificent city, Strasbourg. I'll never forget that I did ascend the, the spire of the cathedral there and looked out across all of the land. And you know, some of you gentlemen may well understand uh, ascending to uh, as high as you can the spire of a cathedral because there you are able to look up at the cap of the spire, which many a mason constructed so beautifully, so exquisitely for the serene and great purpose that only God may look down to appreciate that. So these are some of the suggestions uh, that I think you, you rightly bring up that I encourage. In visiting these various palazzos and chateaus and manor houses, um, Bridget and Tom are curious how they may have impacted your own designs of the landscapes, the gardens, the farming techniques here at Monticello. Such a worthy question because I have written this distinctly and continue to stand behind it. I think it is in gardening that the British so excel. And therefore, yes, my experiences with Mr. and Mrs. Adams traveling through the Midlands of England has been of great influence in my design, the improving of the grounds here uh, at Monticello. I consider it very British, very uh, English in its particularly natural uh, uh, walkways and paths and plantings, if you will. Uh, I mentioned earlier Thomas Watley uh, and Capability Brown. They emphasize the element of embellishing nature. Uh, and that distinctly British. It is different from the French because I noticed having uh, traveled through many of the French chateaux and their gardens, that the gardens are more mathematically and, and strictly delineated in straight lines and the like. That's a carryover, if you will, from the medieval ages. And not to say they are uh, planted in any the less uh, of beauty and utility. And by utility, I mean with herb gardens and medicinal plants. Um, and I will tell you furthermore, that having had the opportunity traveling through the Northern Italy's, as I mentioned, uh, near Milan, I visited the Cortosa de Pavia. Uh, this is a magnificent church uh, and its monastery. And there what intrigued me so were the art or the art of the monks who in their small little cells would cultivate gardens on the outside of their, their rooms and cultivate with a purpose of what you might call um, homeopathy, if I may use that word. Uh, the elements within nature that are beneficial for our health. They cultivated particular herbs and, and, and plants that they could then utilize for preserving good health. So, uh, so I, I can certainly tell you that not only the architecture uh, of many of the buildings that uh, I was able to see in my travels, but certainly the industry of horticulturalists and gardeners uh, and the designs, if you will, of gardeners uh, remain of influence. Now, I do not want to belay a particular subject in architecture, but I think it's most useful because as you're visiting here at Monticello, the greatest example of what I, I was totally enamored of during my time in Paris is the design of my mansion house. Distinctly so. 
And what you see as you visit here is the second design. Uh, the first design was somewhat Italian, uh, close to plate number 37 in James Gibbs' book on architecture. And by the way, uh, that house, uh, only the eight rooms, still exists uh, within the renovation, the renovation that I began in the late 1790s. It's that renovation that is in imitation of a beautiful townhouse I watched being built in Paris, or l'hôtel's. Hotel, as the French refer to them, their townhouses. Built by a very wealthy German prince, uh, the Prince uh, de Salm, S-A-L-M. Uh, built on the Rive Gauche, the left bank of the Seine River. I was able to watch it in its construction from the Tuileries Gardens. And there to see three stories hidden behind a one-story facade, and then the entire building capped with a delicate dome. Do you know when I sailed to France in the summer of 1784, there were no domes upon any building in, in our new nation. Now they were attempting to build one on the state house in Annapolis, but it was very cumbersome. There was no prototype. So here was the opportunity to watch a dome being built according to the delineations of Filippo de Norme, uh, the Italian architect of the 16th century. And that is what I endeavored to recreate here in the design of the second Monticello. So I hope you will observe from without, let alone within, the great influence that I brought back with me in architecture from the Belfonts. How wonderful when we can allow our travels to inspire and influence our paths forward. Earlier today, you had mentioned going as far north as Bennington, Vermont, as well as Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, and Norm wants to know how far south in our country were you able to travel? And Brendan is curious, how come you never make it past the Blue Ridge Mountains? Brendan, I would say only this. The reason I have not traveled the more extensively is because of my continued occupation in managing as best I can the inheritance of all my farms, let alone the care of all of the families that I have inherited, uh, and providing as best as possible uh, enough remuneration, enough, um, if you will, revenue to, to keep all of this as best for all of us. And I say that simply because after 40 years in public service, having finally retired here, although retirement's not a word of my vocabulary, I emphasize once more, we are finding ourselves the deeper and deeper in debt. Whereas I had hoped to have more time to travel extensively throughout our nation, I now lament that it may never happen. So when you ask how, why I have never traveled farther west of the Blue Ridge, Simply that reason, although I will tell you, as I mentioned, I traveled out to Bath County. It was for the purpose of enjoying the, um, the thermal baths there, and in particular uh, at Hot Springs. <laughs> well, I was told that as I was becoming the more encumbered by the rheumatiz, the older I become, uh, the much more inconvenient, that if you venture to Warm Springs, there's a hostelry there uh, named the Homestead that will provide you a comfort for the rheumatism. And so I went that far to the West and um, I dumped myself in those springs there. Uh, for two weeks, two weeks, I endeavored that therapy. And I meant to inform you that after two weeks I wrote, it left me with boils and a sense of ennui. So that was the farthest uh, to the West. Now, why not farther down South here in our own uh, uh, Commonwealth of Virginia. I have ventured down to Scottsville. That's a good 20 miles uh, down the Scottsville Road here from Charlottesville. My late brother, of course, having resided at Snowden Plantation, uh, which you can see across the James River from Scottsville on a, on a hill, not a, as high a mountain. Uh, I have traveled uh, south of that to a little settlement, they uh, call it Dillon now, uh, but that, I lament to say, is probably the, the most southern extent. I would very much enjoy to go down to Mecklenburg County uh, to visit, if you will, what they call the Bluestone there along the Roanoke River. Um, the good friends of mine and relatives on my, my late wife's side, the Skipwiths, were resident there at Presswold Plantation, Presswold Plantation 
on the north banks of the Roanoke River. And that used to be, if you will, what was called the Bluestone Castle, a truly so. Uh, a residence, a very elegant residence, they say, built by a former Colonel William Byrd of Westover. Those were all of his holdings and land, because I think you might recall he wrote a history of surveying the Virginia and North Carolina boundary line uh, to the west, which coincidentally uh, was surveyed only to the easternmost ranges of the Blue Ridge. But what about the, the rest of the delineation of Virginia and North Carolina through the Blue Ridge Mountains? My own father accomplished that. That in the company of his good friend and neighbor, Colonel Joshua Fry. They actually surveyed the, the bird boundary line of Virginia and, and Carolina, 90 miles farther west uh, to the western ranges of the Blue Ridge. They are to where the Holston River is wont to flow ultimately uh, to, to the Mississippi. Uh, and so I can tell you, being most interested all my life, brought up, uh, regaled with those stories of that survey pursued by my father and Colonel Fry, yes, I, I would hope to have that opportunity, but there's far too much more of necessity that preoccupies me. I believe many of us can relate to limiting our travels due to those necessities of life. If you weren't burdened with such things as finances and time, where would you love to go? What is your dream vacation, your dream travel trip? Well, back to La Belle France, my second home, truly. To meet with my old friend, uh, General the Marquis de Lafayette, so many others, Madame de Tessé, de Man, Madame de Hottentot, all of the, the people that I became so friendly with, became like family to me, to visit some of those old haunts. Yes, I cannot deny to partake further of their, well, the ever-changing and novel recipes and the most elegant cuisine that I so enjoyed, further visits to many a vineyard through Bourgogne, Bordeaux, if you will, to enjoy their, their wines. No two hectares cultivating exactly the same wine. That is what is so marvelous about French viticulture and their knowledge of terroir. Uh, and I should not deny further travels through the Italys to appreciate their wines, Nebbiolo, and their cuisine, to visit once more, if you will, where the cheeses are made there in uh, Rosano, the Parmesan cheese. I had the opportunity to see just exactly how it is, is made and, and how it is sliced so delicately, very much a part of my recipe for, well, macaroni and cheese. I would say, though, ultimately, extensive travels through our own nation. I mentioned that and emphasized it earlier. I would like to visit up north more extensively, uh, go up to where my son-in-law uh, was encamped, if you will, during the War of 1812, as the French referred to it, the Mille Isles, <laughs> the thousands of islands, extraordinary. They tell me it's the, the Garden of the Gods where all the Great Lakes empty into the St. Lawrence River there and on the New York side, uh, known as Jefferson County. I would like to venture far to the south, below the Virginia Caroline, to visit my friends, the Middletons, if you will, and the Draytons uh, in South Carolina and farther into Georgia, to visit Savannah that I've heard so much about. Uh, my, my grandson, Frank Epps, has an interest to go to the Floridas, to the uh, native settlement of Tallahassee with the idea to cultivate pineapple, can you imagine? Uh, and to establish, he says, a, a university there. Uh, Frank Epps uh, has so beguiled me with an interest to travel farther south in our nation. But I believe that many of you may best understand my great hope someday to make that trip westward that was accomplished by Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark. As I wrote, having commissioned that voyage of the Corps of Discovery, had it not been for the burdens of office, for the shackles of administration, I would have been on that expedition. I would very much enjoy to see the mouth of the Missouri River, to travel up it, to see the falls of the great Missouri, to visit the Mandan Hidatsas and the many native tribes that were encountered and I hope will remain friends of our nation as I suggested to, to Lewis and Clark. To visit far west, the great stony mountains I've heard referred to now as the Rockies, 
uh, to revisit that pathway through the Stony Mountains that was shown by the bird woman, the Sassoni woman, Sacagawea, uh, as to be the true passage there to connect with the Snake River on the western end, and then finally the Columbia and out to that extraordinary mouth of the Columbia River with the Western Ocean. This would indeed be, be my wish and my hope, if so allowed by the great architect of our universe. Sounds like a wonderful wish. Well, thank you, Lizzie. Yes, who would not have the wish to see more, to see more for the short time that we are here on this globe. Do you have any final advice for those who do have an interest in fulfilling that wish in traveling? Be cautious. Be cautious for two things. Uh, we began our conversation earlier with my caution to maintain good health on your travels. Truly, that has always been a caution throughout uh, the history of mankind. A cautious as to the water you drink. A cautious as to the foods that you engage. A cautious, if you will, for the peoples who are native unto their own land with certain the manners of maintaining good health and, and their cautions uh, for certain diseases that might befall them. We should no less uh, be concerned uh, for ourselves as we visit. And this is also applicable to our native land here as we travel throughout our nation. Be cautious. And secondly, if you will, do not forget the great beauty, the great resources the great camaraderie that we all experience amongst ourselves as Americans, welcoming so many people continuing to come to, to our land, land to partake of all with which we are already blessed. Be cautious when you travel, particularly throughout the kingdoms of Europe, that you not acquire new habits, you do not uh, acquire new, a new element of happiness, so you might think, that you do not come look upon certain other morals uh, different from those that engaged when you were growing up. Be cautious of all of this that may come to hit you all at once through a sense of wonder and curiosity. Be cautious that you not pursue it so much to an extent that you may look back on our own nation with less of a a love or less of an interest or concern for the continued improvement of our nation. When I returned to our nation, I hope to have brought back with me all that could lift the tastes of our countrymen to help us better understand the foundation of the wonders of nature and resources and bounty therein with which we have already been blessed. So those are my, my cautions as we continue to travel, but I encourage travel because in my opinion, there is no other realm in the pursuit of education that helps an individual understand fully the family of man and all of its diversity, particularly relevant to the environments and the climates uh, where he lives. And then that further appreciation, the education for our own nation and how we can rise above with the principles in our Declaration of American Revolution and, and Independence to be a beacon light for the rest of the world. That is what General Washington referred to as our promise. I thank you for this opportunity that we have gathered here today. I thank you, Miss Melissa, for all of these questions and the many questions being provided by, by our guests. Uh, I welcome you to return. I welcome to share more stories with you of my travels, and in particular, the various places in themselves and, uh, and what may lift the tastes of our own countrymen. And I thank you indeed for simply listening to the continual verbios of your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.